And, and a question that I get asked all the time, and actually, um, you had asked it during the break, and I said, let's wait, let's ask it when, when we're having the conversation, is then why do we have an ego? Is the ego useful? So here's what we need to understand about the ego. It is only thoughts. Are thoughts useful? Yes, they are, because we need thoughts to begin to operate with each other. But this is what is not, what is not useful about the ego, is that they are thoughts that block the truth. So the ego is nothing more than thoughts. Is it useful? They're thoughts. You can decide what thoughts work for you, but it is not helpful to live your life with in misinformation. To have information in my mind that says that I am you know, insufficient because I wasn't a boy is not a useful thought, not useful at all. So do I want to hold on to that thought? No. So when you no longer give power to a thought, that dissolves. It's an illusion because it's not really real. It's not tangible. It's, it's an energy that is, is condensed. And when you release that energy, it's energy that gets put back in motion. So there's a lot of work that has to be done in understanding our thoughts, understanding what God is. And as you begin to understand your thoughts and understand what God is, as you release a thought that's not true, you get to feel more of the reality of God. But you cannot feel God while you block it with thoughts that are not true. So the process for me to get to really feel love is, was a, a beautiful, beautiful, um, you know, life is going to give us opportunities to feel truth all over the place, as well as opportunities to feel what's not true. Because we're bumping up against what's not true all the time. Why? God wants us to get out of that hole. And God wants us to get out of that hole because God created us to give and receive love. And the Course tells us God is lonely waiting for us to receive its love because God is here all by itself waiting to be extended. And when we suppress love, we suppress God. So let me share a, an example and then we'll go to questions of how I began to feel love. So when I was going through, um, let me think, it was Halloween night and I, I can't remember exactly what year it was, but this was at a time when I was beginning to have memories of, of why I had my relationships were the way that they were. And I was beginning to piece things together and begin to question my thoughts. And my thoughts were leading me to, to feelings of abandonment. And this was shortly after my mom passed away, about two years. It took me about two years to begin to realize that so much of my fear besides death was I was angry my mom abandoned me. And my mom abandoning me, once I, I pieced that together, wow, mom abandoned me, then all of a sudden I began to feel, dad did too. So the abandonment of my mom's death began to trigger the abandonment of my dad. At the same time that I'm beginning to have these memories, my dear, dear friend, my best friend who lived right across the street from me, she had gone through a divorce and she had met a new man. And as I'm feeling this abandonment from my dad, she's entering into this deep relationship with, with her boyfriend. Guess what's happening? Guess who she doesn't have time to be with? Me. So I'm feeling abandoned by her as I'm, ex I'm beginning to process the abandonment of my father. So as life would have it, a very intelligent power that's moving us all to bump up against each other so we can uh, uh, release the, our ego because the ego is like a shell that we have built around ourselves. So what is God in its infinite knowledge doing? It's making all of us, our shells, you know, bump up against each other so they'll crack. But they won't crack unless we allow the cracking because we're the ones who have to let the light in. Um, so we're the ones who have to be willing to open the shell. So here, Halloween night, my sweet little children are off with their dad uh, trick-or-treating and my friend's um, former husband had come over to take their daughters trick-or-treating. So she's across the street handing out candy and I'm across the street handing out candy. We weren't more than, you know, I, I don't know how far that is, 60 feet, 70 feet, you know, it's a typical subdivision, all those row houses. So I'm watching her over there and I'm having this feeling of my dad abandoning me. And then all of a sudden, her new boyfriend 
walks in. He, I saw his car pulled in. He must have gone up through the garage. And then he comes out the front door right behind her. And I'm watching. And where she was looking at me and we were waving at each other, all of a sudden he comes in, sits next to her, and her attention turned to him. In that moment, I felt abandoned. The second that I fa felt that abandonment, I went, I had that feeling of this little girl totally abandoned by my dad. And as I'm sitting watching what was happening in front of me, I, in that moment, began to realize my dad didn't abandon me because he didn't love me. My dad found some other woman to love, so he went towards love. He went towards love. He was honest enough with himself to say, I'm not in love with my mom. I'm in love with this woman. So he honored something inside of me. There was a movement that had him fall in love with somebody else. So when I saw my friend falling in love with this new man, in that moment, I fell in love with my dad. All that love that was inside of me began to pour. I had so much love coming from me. I began to love my friend for the lesson she gave me. I began to love this man for loving my friend. I began to feel this incredible love for my, my dad. I began to feel love inside of me. And that's when I realized I'm made of love. And God is love. And I'm feeling love. And I am God. God is love. I am love. God and I became one in that moment. And it, I'm sure it scared the little trick or treaters to death because I'm passing out candy and I'm bawling and crying. Oh and the kids are coming from the neighborhood. The parents, are you okay? I'm like, I'm, I'm feeling love. Here, have a trick, you know, have a, have a um, Twix or whatever it is. You want M&Ms? Um, and there were moments that I was so engulfed in so much incredible, it just this experience. What it gave me also at the time, haven't you guys have moments where you had realizations and all of a sudden the pieces begin to make sense? In that moment, I realized as these little kids came up to me in their costumes, I realized I've been wearing a costume all those years. I've been wearing a mask. I was pretending to be this tough cookie that doesn't need a man when all I really wanted was to love my dad. I wanted my dad to want me because and I stopped wanting my dad to prove to him, I don't need you. All the while, all I was doing was blocking myself from being the presence of love and saying, you know, dad, that's okay. If you want to be happy, go be happy. But at 10 years old, that's not how I was raised. So it's so amazing. Shortly thereafter, I ended up getting divorced. And when I went to my youngest son, who at the time, I think, what was he, eight years old? I went and I said, all right, sweetie, you know, mommy and daddy are getting divorced. And he said to me, that's okay, mommy. You and daddy are like two cars on the highway and you're both going, uh, you know, in parallel roads and your road's going this way, his is going that way, it's okay. And I went, oh, wow. When you raise somebody to know that their truth is inside of them, they don't let what's outside of them affect them. So my, my child's ability to love both of us, no matter what, came because he loved himself enough. So with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. I know I've shared a lot of information, but this is this is something that it, I want you guys to take pictures of that um, because it's so, so important. But we'll, we'll make sure that we take pictures because I'm going to do something with this in a minute that we need to make sure your pictures are done before I change it up. But you, you were going to ask something? Do you want to go to the microphone? Not really. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, let's let's go ahead and you start to the microphone. I have a question because you were I thought you were walking in this direction. So I just wanted to drop that line here. We're making wrong use of the world. We're making things because when I've read the Course in Miracles, it speaks to that making. Mm -hmm. And there's a place that um, I just wanted you to address that knowledge, knowing versus perceiving. Mm -hmm. oh, we may not be there, which I'm fine with that too. So wonderful, wonderful question. So knowledge is what God knows. And we perceive, like we, I perceive the room to be what I'm seeing in front of me. But God knows the room because God sees all of it. So what we're dropping is our small perception. We're dropping our slice of the pie and receiving the whole pie. So knowing is the whole pie. But to be able to receive all knowing, we've got to get out of what I know, which is a paradox. For, for me, people um, will ask me, so, you know, you know a lot about spirituality. I said, well, actually, 
I, I prefer not to know spirituality. I prefer to open myself up and let the knowing come through me. So I don't need to be right about my sliver of the pie because I know who knows everything. So if I have a question, I just, God, what would you have me know? So knowing is going to the authority and perception is my limited perception, my limited experience is my point of awareness of what I've experienced. And that's the difference and we wanna drop that. And then this making the, the, the difference between creating and making is God created everything and we're, we're making stuff up. So for example, we make buildings up, but they change, they crumble, they fall apart. Nothing that man has created is going to stand forever as what God created. So God creates what's permanent and we make use of what God created and we make up stuff. So we make up religions, we make up um, buildings, we make up categories about people, we make up careers, we, we make stuff up, we make up our identity, and that's what we are having to realize is that we've made up something that's not doesn't alter God, but it doesn't alter who we are. When I take off my mask, the true me is still there. So ego is a block to me knowing what God created because I'm operating from what I'm making up. And that's why what we made up is, is an illusion because it will not stand the test of time. A couple more generations who you were, sure. who cares? Um, and, and even a few more lifetimes, we're gonna stop looking at history books because when you know God, you live in the now moment where you're creating. When we operate from history books, we're, we're re re replicating, we're Xeroxing, which is why we keep having these wars that don't accomplish anything. Mm. But that's the way it was done. So that's the difference between the two. And you? My question was whether you were d doing, do I need to go to the that's, that's okay. Whether you were doing the course when you had that awareness, that moment of awareness. And so her question is, was I doing the course when I had that moment of awareness? No. Um, when that happened, I had, it's when I was being, when I was starting to receive a course, the power of awareness. So as I was receiving guidance that I was supposed to teach the power of awareness, I was having my own moments of awareness so that I would know what I was going to be teaching. But it, the course came to me about five years later. But the power of awareness prepared me yes, because in the power of awareness, I was taught to divide everything into, into love and fear, into reality and, and illusion. So that, that foundation was set. Yes. I'm having my experiences and now what was in my head was being felt in my heart. That then prepared me for the course, which is way deeper, yes, yes. way, way deeper. Okay. Yes. You. Yes. I have so many questions. Um, I was wondering if you might um, talk a little bit more about God creating a son or another mm -hmm. to experience love. <clears throat> um, I'd love to know more about that because that seems so limit. I, I guess limiting. You would think that God would say, "I am love. I am whole." What would be the need to create something to mirror it back? So and the Course says it's just for giving and receiving, for the joy of extending, for the joy of extending. And so God creates us so that we can then extend love, so that the game can continue in infinity. And because it's infinite possibilities, it creates, so when you begin to expand your mind and you begin to realize that we're not the only ones out in the universe, that then, then God has created some, so many infinite beings all to extend love because, because what is love, so if you were, are you a loving person? Do you feel you're loving? Yes. Do you enjoy sharing that or would you be okay if you never no. had anybody else around you? No, and that makes total sense to me and I guess I'm trying to make that connection because my human brain, my ego says mm -hmm. what well, makes total sense. Yeah. When I think of God in infinite and wholeness, I think why would you need another to have it come back? Yeah. So I'm just trying to get that some yeah. understanding around that. And, <clears> and just, clarification. just simplify it. How fun would your life be if, the, if you were in a desolate desert, nobody else around, nothing to share that with? Yeah. And maybe that's a great way to think about it. It's it's God's desire to have that share mm -hmm. because I, it's one and the same. So that, yeah, I'm just trying to get my arms around like, hmm, why would that be necessary? But also because God mm -hmm. extends through us. Right. So it creates and creates, you know, rocks right. are energy expressing love. Right. So are grains of sand, so are trees. All of that knows what it is and extends. We are the only ones who suppress. 
and we suppress because we have been um, conditioned to believe that who we are is not okay, so our love cannot extend because we suppress it, but that's what we're discovering is it's a lot more fun to extend it. Right, no, that makes sense, thank you for that. And then one last thing of is course. that um, my mind, um, my ego-driven mind wants to wonder why our right side of the column, as you're standing looking, our reality, how my ego can say that's not a copy. Yeah. Well, your ego would like to say that's, yeah. Right. It, so what does the course say about that? Well, the course is saying that once you begin to, to put these things into practice and ask your, yourself the question, well, what if it wasn't a copy? Then what would be there? Mm -hmm. And it's to begin to question things as if, what, what if this is true? What if this was, was a reality? What would that feel like? It's to begin to train us from doing what we've always been doing, repeating, regurgitating, to trying something new. And when you try something new, like for me in that moment, seeing my dad as he loved somebody as opposed to that he hated me, mm -hmm. totally shifted me. And that's when I knew this is real. This is real because I felt it inside of me. So you're not ever going to feel real. You're not going to experience reality as real until you feel it. And you gotta transcend the thought that tells you that you can't or that, you know, stay away from it. It is a feeling thing. Mm -hmm. Gotta feel it too, to really embody it. Thank you. Of course, that. thank you.